Like a night drive With the windows down By the shoreline In my hometown Like a long talk Till the sun comes up On my back porch We're in no rush Like an old friend You're like an old friend I wanna stay All right, welcome to the Village Church. Good to see you. My name is Wade Bryant. I'm the Connections Director here. Whether you're here in person or joining on us online, we're glad that you're here. If you could do me a favor, um, if you could, if there's some seats in the middle of you, if you could scoot in to make room. We still have lots of people coming into our parking lot that would love a space here today. So you would be a kind neighbor and just kind of scoot in. That'd be great. Um, man, we'd love to connect with you today. If you are new or, or just have been coming for a short while, you can do a few things here. So you can text the word belong to 56549. 
You can scan the QR code in front of you that's in the seat back in front of you or a neighbor. Um, and that'll take you to our new here page. Or you can come find someone in a blue welcome shirt and they love to have a conversation with you. Even in Connection Central, we'd love to give you a gift. And so, um, yeah, we just love to connect with you in that way. Um, uh, uh, and also, you might have won the lottery today because in front of you, you realize that you can actually see the stage a little bit better because the person in front of you might be just a little bit shorter. And that's because we have our Kids Village kids in here today. So Kids Village, where are you at? Y'all in here? Hey, everyone. <laughs> Good to see y'all. Yeah. All right, so those are our first through fifth graders. And actually, in the month of July, our Kids Village leaders get a month to just kind of refresh and recoup. But we're happy to have our Kids Village in here today. Um, a couple things going on. So next week, when you arrive over on the east side of our building and where our shuttle drop-off is, you will see tents. It is not a carnival, okay? So don't get too excited. But it's a ministry fair, all right? So you're going to be able to come and hear about what's going on in the life of the church. How do you get involved? How do you continue to grow and move towards loving God, loving people, and making disciples of Jesus Christ? And so there'll be a scavenger hunt. There's games. There's free coffee and all kinds of different ministries that you can connect with. That is next Sunday before, in between, and after each service. We'd love to have you join us for that ministry fair and kickoff. And then lastly, if you... Um, just are a new parent, a new foster parent, a new adoptive parent, we would love to invite you on September 4th to have us celebrate with you um, on our birth and adoption announcement, all right? So this is happening. Um, we, if you, you know, ever find yourself needing a pick-me-up and you peruse the internet for maybe some puppy videos, you know, just watching a good puppy video. Um, this is like that, but like to the thousandth degree because we want our, our, these parents to submit videos uh, of their kiddos and just let us welcome them in as a church. And so that's happening. If you want to be a part of that, uh, submit your videos by August 19th. You can find the registration online. And then also um, afterwards, you'll, you'll be able to meet our family ministry team and our kids ministry team. And they'd love to just give you resources and everything like that afterwards. You get all those details. So we'd love to invite you to that. So um, we're so excited that you're here and that we get to worship the King today. If you guys would stand up and let's get started. Just wanted to take a, a moment before we start singing together, um, just to breathe out for a second. If you're like me and you know, rush to wake up, get ready, if I plan well, I have a little bit of time in the Word before I come, but that's not always happening. But I feel like I rush from one thing to the next, and I finally get here, and um, it's like I just need a moment to remember why we're here, why we're gathered. Um, Matt and I uh, went to, had the chance to go to Greece this summer for uh, the missionary journeys of Paul. And we went to ancient Philippi where Lydia was a woman who was a God seeker. And she would go to the stream to seek God, to pray with others. And she went looking for God at this stream and God showed up in the form of the apostle Paul who would come and share the gospel with her, to share that the God you've been seeking is Jesus. This is who he is. And I love how throughout scripture, God meets with his people and show, gives us this uh, picture of what he's doing with water, where the Holy Spirit's like water um, to our souls, that water, it satisfies our thirst. It's peaceful, it gives us replenishment and comfort. Like there's nothing like a glass of cold water on a hot day. And then um, it cleanses us. When we feel dirty, it cleanses us. And that is such a picture of what we long for, not just physically, but spiritually, and how God provides for us there, that he is the one who cleanses us, that we can come to him and he cleans us, that he's the one that brings refreshing and replenishment. And when we don't have peace, we can find it there. He wants to be found by us. He is a good God who satisfies our longings. And Jesus isn't just that, but he satisfies all the promises of God in Scripture. That he is the king that our hearts long for. He is the king of the kingdom that we want. 
and that he deserves praise. And that's why we gather, to be reminded we have a kingdom that we can't see with our eyes yet, who has a king who rules, who reigns, who satisfies every longing and every promise. So let's exalt him together because it's good. All hail King Jesus, all hail the Lord of heaven and earth, all hail King Jesus, all hail the Savior of the world, it's all hail. 
perfect son of God in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief a man of sorrow a son of suffering oh blood and tears There's a God who weeps. There's a God who weeps. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. And hallelujah to the Son of Sovereigns.
Father, I ask as we prepare our hearts now to hear from your word, that you would move in us, you would open us up to what you want to teach us today, what you want to change and grow in us. Father, as we leave here today, may our lives be more glorifying to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. morning village church my name is luke boblet and with my wife amanda we are your goers in berlin germany yeah we live there with our kids lucy and max they're not here sorry um but if you have a heart for europe or if you have a heart for urban post-christian disciple making Come see us, please. We'll be next door in Suite 165 from 12.15 to 2.30. We'd love to chat. Our scripture today is Luke 18, 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Luke. Hey, guys. It's good to see you. I missed you. Let me start with this. If you are a first through sixth grader, do me a favor, just stand up where you are right now. First through six, go ahead and stand up. And stay standing up for a second. Stay standing up. Hold on, don't, don't sit back down yet. Just stand up for me. Now, let's look at each other real quick. Hey, look, let's look at each other. The Holy Spirit of God is going to do incredible things through you guys. And I'm so pumped that in some little way I just get to be in this moment with you. And so I love you. I think the devil's scared of you. And I'm eager to watch how God uses you to push back darkness and establish light in the decades to come. Glad you're here. Why don't you guys have a seat? Now, I love it. By the way, I'm Matt. I'm Pastor Matt. If, yeah. Uh, man, I hope you enjoyed the guys we brought in for my little summer break. I thought they each crushed it in their own unique way. Um, I don't ever want to not be deeply moved by that passage. In the Premier Mine, which is in South Africa in 1905, a man by the name of Frederick Wells found the largest diamond that's ever been found, 3,106 carats. It is a type 2A diamond with D clarity. It is the perfect stone. It resides now, as you would, if I gave you a chance to guess, you could probably pull it off. In, a, in the Tower of London in England, they had a way of snatching up from around the world things that didn't belong to them. And that's where uh, that diamond currently uh, resides. And if you, if you could get the opportunity to hold it in your hand, and you won't, <laughs> right? It, now think, it's the si- like, think it's the size of a softball, right? It's the size of a softball. If you could ever hold it in your hand and you could hold it up to light and as you kind of turned it around, you you would see that each side of it, each direction that you looked at the diamond, it it would refract light a little bit differently. There would be something unique about the the other side of it and the underneath of it and the overway of it and and, and it would be uh, stupefyingly beautiful in each direction. In fact, I think it would be hard to keep in your mind, yeah, that's a diamond. Right? That's not just some weird rock. It, it, like, that's a diamond diamond. It's not like something you bought at Six Flags. Right? It, it's just fascinating. And I, and I thought that, um, yeah, I didn't think that. I, I was doing a paper for school, and the paper had to be like on the metaphor, like gospel metaphors in uh, the New Testament. And, and as I was writing the paper, this, this is what I thought of, that the gospel is this kind of really beautiful thing that there are all these angles at which you, you can look at it, and, it, and, and each angle you turn, there's a little bit more, there's a little refraction of light, and yet it, it's stupefyingly beautiful regardless where you come. So we wanted to do, I wanted to do this series. It's a five-week series, and it's just going to be on the gospel. And, and I think, by and large, we know what the gospel is. Maybe not all of us in the room know what the gospel is, but, but the gospel is simply that. God created the world in perfect harmony. No disease, no death, no despair, no broken. He creates it in what, what the Hebrews would call shalom, rhythm. Think of a symphony, all playing their parts perfectly. And then sin enters the cosmos and fractures everything. Everything down to the cellular level, all the way out to the furthest reaches of the cosmos, affected by sin entering the cosmos. Man's rebellion against God fractures everything. And God, who uh, is uh, great in love, the has said love of God, the long-suffering love of God, doesn't then turn and destroy man, but moves towards man in grace. Uh, by sending the second person of the Trinity, the, the second person of the triune God of the universe, the Son of God. He comes in the form of a man. Like, I, I, I can't wait for the fall, fall series that will start in September. Like, he comes like one of his own creation. The creator comes as created. And he lives the perfect life 
that has evaded you and I from the moment we breathed oxygen. And then he's murdered, hung on a cross, and there on that cross, he absorbs all of God's wrath towards those who would believe and purchases the redemption of all things by his blood. Invisible and visible, rulers, powers, authorities, nations. Right? He, he, he purchases by his blood all those who will believe upon his name by faith through grace. And in his resurrection, we see that regardless of our backstory, regardless of our present struggles, those who have put their faith in Christ are seen as spotless and blameless in his sight. All right, so there you go. There's the gospel. That Jesus is making all things new. There you go. There's, there's the gospel. Now, there's a multitude of ways to look at the gospel in a way that if you're a believer should increase your worship and if you're not a believer should woo you into the best news the universe will ever know. And so for the next five weeks, we're going to we're going to get after it. We're going to cover justification today. And, and, and if you've got a background in church or you, you might have heard justification means just as if you've never sinned. Anybody heard that? Justification means just as if, which is kind of right, but, but it's not completely that, right? It, justification is not, I don't want to preach my sermon before I preach my sermon, but justification isn't just that he takes you back to Eden, right? It's not just that he, you, just as if you've never sinned. Not only are, are you, is the slate wiped clean, but you're also made a kind of spiritual billionaire. So justification isn't just that you're forgiven. It's bigger than that. It's that you're a spiritual billionaire. And we'll talk about that more here in a bit. And then next week, we're going to talk about new creation. Like this idea that the gospel transforms our whole life. It's an ontological transformation. Our whole reality changes. Sorry for ontological. I try not to use words like that, right? It's just like the whole reality of my being has been changed by the gospel. Then we're going to talk about adoption. That Before the foundation of the earth was laid, the Lord saw you and loved you and said, I want him. I want her. Look at me. If nobody else wants you, Jesus does. If nobody else wants you, Jesus does. And then after adoption, we're going to dive into redemption. And goodness sakes, I can't wait for redemption. That nothing is wasted by God. That no tear, no hurt no foolishness, nothing is wasted. All is redeemed and more than redeemed, weaponized against the very one who sought to destroy me with that stuff. That'll, that's going to preach, but not for, that's four weeks from now. And then lastly, like what does union with Christ have to do with the gospel? That this power in which we live in this new creation, this power of which we embrace our adoption, this power at which we, we walk in, in stewardship of our spiritual billions happens because we're in Christ, not because of our own discipline or effort, but because we're in Christ. And so um, I, I turned 48 in June. Whatever athleticism was there back in my day, which wasn't much to begin with, if I'm really honest, is completely gone now. Like if I were to take off running right now, you would wonder if I was joking. <laughs> but you put me in a truck and I can go the speed limit. <laughs> because I love and fear the Lord. You put me in a plane. Man, I'll, I'll see you at 36,000 feet and 400 miles an hour. What I cannot do on my own, you put me in something, all the rules change. That'll be the last week of it. But like I said, th this week I want to just talk to you about justification. And my hope is to keep these short and very clear and then to make an appeal for you to believe it. All right? So here we go. Uh, Lauren and I, um, by the grace of God, got to fly to the Mediterranean on my summer break. We got to see the sights of Paul. Like I, I, I was in Patmos, in the cave where they think the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. We were in Pergamum. We were in Patmos. We were in these places that we read about. The geography and the, the scriptures correctness around geography blew my mind. Like when the Bible says he went up to, like, like you get, you're there and you're like, oh, he went up to. Yeah, that's right. 
He went down to, oh, yeah, yeah, you went down to. Like the, the script, it just blew my mind that this book that I've spent so long studying, I'm physically there and seeing it. And on the flight over, I had to do some work, so I was doing some work, and then um, I watched um, The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> like, I don't, that's not a joke. I'm just telling you, what did you think? I was an art film guy? Certainly you didn't think I was an art film guy. And so I watched The Dark Knight Rises, probably the 30th time I've seen the movie. And, um, and, and I knew I'm preaching this. You know, we're, we're planned way out. Uh, and so I knew I was doing this series, and I knew... Um, you know, I, I know the, the pieces of justification and how they, but I'm watching The Dark Knight Rises and they introduce Catwoman, which whatever. And uh, I'm not here to see Catwoman, all right? I want Batman to harm people who are evil, right? To be the justice of God uh, across Gotham. Uh, but if you remember in this movie in particular, um, Catwoman is looking for something called the clean slate, Remember the movie? I mean, I, it, I don't know if you've seen it. Spoiler alert, it came out in 2012, so this is on you. <laughs> she has lived a kind of past that has caught up to her present. And her present is being hard-pressed by her past. So much so that she can't imagine her future. You with me? So there's this promise that there's this thing called the clean slate. And if she can get her hands on the clean slate, she can erase her past, put hope into her future and, or into her present and move into the future that she desires for herself. I don't think Christopher Nolan was trying to teach a lesson on justification. But that's what the clean slate is. That, that's what the clean slate is justification. So, so let me show you this. I love this. We're going to look at that narrative at the end of the sermon. What I want to do is just kind of lay in front of you a real clear explanation of what justification is and more importantly, what it's not. So the first thing to know is this, like, this word justification, uh, it means just. It means right. Like in the Greek, not that you care about the Greek, uh, but in the Greek, the word justification and righteousness is actually a very similar Greek word. They have the same root. So when we say justification, we're saying just. When we're saying justification, we're saying right. You are righteous. You are just. You are clean in front of God. That when God sees you, he sees you as blameless, as spotless, as holy. That's justification. And here's what Galatians 2, 15 says about it. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Listen, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So there's two things going here when we consider how, how am I right before God? How am I holy before God? How, how am I right before my creator? The, the first thing that he's going to argue here very subtly within the context of Galatians 2, is that the Jews who thought they had right standing, thought they were just, thought they were clean by God because of their historic identity as the chosen people of God, actually weren't justified by that at all. Now, how do you pull that into 2022? Here's how. Here, look right at me. You cannot be born a Christian. You can be born a Muslim, you cannot be born a Christian. And look at me. Your daddy's faith and love for Jesus Christ doesn't get imputed to you. It's his. You're not saved because you were born into a Christian house. You're not a Christian because your folks loved Jesus. You're not even a Christian because you grew up in the church. You cannot justify yourself via your heritage. You cannot justify yourself before God piggybacking on someone else's faith in the grace of God. This is what the Jews were doing. And Paul's going, like right before this is this huge argument between Peter and Paul where Peter stopped 
eating with Gentiles and would only eat with Jews because he was saying the Gentiles had to actually become Jews before they could receive the promises. And Paul, this is what the text says, confronted him to his face. This is for free messages over here. Like this, there's this version of Christianity right now that says what's most loving is for us to remain silent about error and, and, and bad teaching. I, I don't see it. I don't see it in Jesus. I, Paul said I confronted him to his face. I didn't passive aggressively meme him. I didn't write uh, an email and say stuff that I would never say to his face. Keyboard makes a lot of people brave that ain't brave. He said, I, I said to his face, you're out of step with the gospel. Back to <laughs> now, the second thing that's present is this very clear teaching that one cannot be justified through works of the law. Now, I want to show you another passage. Um, this is Romans 3, 21 through 24. But now, the righteousness of God, so the justice of God, the rightness of God has been made manifest, has been made visible apart from the law. So he, let, me, let me tell you what's going on here in Romans 3. Eventually, we're preaching through Romans. I'm just going to need like a two-year run for it. So he, he, he says here, you want to know the justice of God? You want to know, like you're looking at the brokenness of the world. You're like, well, man, this is really evil. How is God just in the world so broken? I mean, these are like real questions that are being asked in our day. Like, how is God just? How is God good if I can see all of this brokenness? Well, Paul says, you want to see God's feeling towards the brokenness of the world? Look to the cross of Jesus. Look to the death of his perfect son. He hates it. He hates it so much that Christ came and died so that the world and everyone on it wouldn't be devoured and destroyed forever. The rightness, the justice of God has been made visible apart from the law by the sending of the Son. And then he goes on. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Okay. How do the law and prophets bear witness to the justice of God in the sending of Jesus? Great question. I was hoping you would ask that. That's why I put it in my notes. Here, two, two ways. One, the law and prophets. Look, look right at me. I love you. This is, this is awful and awesome. The law and prophets exist to help you see that you're not a good person. Hey, look at me. I lo God, I love you so much. I, I would hug you right now. You, look at me. You are a terrible person. <laughs> I, I don't even know. Like, that's a weird thing to giggle at. I'm not making a joke. I'm telling you, this passage says the law and prophets exist so you would know you're terrible. What about my self-esteem, pastor? I, I don't care about your self-esteem. So, so let's, let's do it. This is the way I've done it for 20 years, by the way. Um, the, the Ten Commandments hung on the wall in my kindergarten class. Now, I know that day's probably way gone. And I want you to keep in mind that, that I was in the Bay Area. Selah. <laughs> and, and by the way, how amazing that in the Bay Area, Ryan Kwan's just a gospel beast, right? Yeah, if you were here for Ryan, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so the Ten Commandments, like, they're so simple that you're like, yeah, Kindergartners can get this. And, and then they also are studied by scholars. So you got something that a kindergartner can understand and a scholar can dive into the depths of. It's not complex ethics. It's pretty straightforward. And look at me. I love you. You get a zero on that test. Look, I, you're like, you don't know me. Listen, I don't have to know you. You're human. We all fail. So like, let's play. Let's play. Well, I've got enough time to play. How many of you love, at, at various times and in various ways, love other things more than you love God? I mean, you're not. Okay, so let's just stop there. So right out of the gate, you're an idolater. But you can't play that game. You're like, I do that, but I'm not an idolater. No, you just said, I love other things more than I love God. I, I pursue them, cherish them, want them, desire them more than I do God. 
Well, that's idolatry. Well, what about this one? Um, anybody lie? My assumption is if your hand's down, you're proving my point in the negative. <laughs> but yeah, but now watch what we do. But I'm not a liar. How about this one? This is terrible. And then this will be the last one. Well, no, I've got to do two because it's the one people go to. I was like, I've got a 20. <laughs> um, anybody ever, maybe even you hate it about yourself, but you, you caught yourself like you, you really liked it when something bad happened to somebody you thought they deserved it? <laughs> oh. How about you got upset when something good happened to somebody who you thought didn't deserve it? Okay, that's coveting. And coveting is an accusation against God that his way of ruling and reigning isn't fair and that you deserve more than... Do you see, do you see what I'm talking about here? Now, the 20%, you want to give yourself a 20, which, by the way, isn't passing. But I'm saying the Ten Commandments show you, you don't even get that 20. So I could be like, How many, anybody murder anybody? And I'm guessing there won't be too many hands raised. <laughs> But, but Jesus says, you have heard it said, do not commit murder. But I tell you, if you have anger in your heart, you're guilty. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say, if you have lust in your heart, you're guilty. Do you see what I mean by Jesus? Jesus is after our hearts, not our external moral action. It's not any act of the law that, that justifies us before a holy God. It's not our morality that gives us right standing, that makes us just, that makes us a pleasing to the Lord. That's sanctification, that over a period of time, the Spirit of God transforms us more and more and more into the image of God. We're not talking sanctification. We're talking justification. You are not justified through works of the law. Uh, my guess if you're like me, when you first got saved, you loved Jesus deeply, and you were pretty confused on how to live. Like, I just had a great conversation with a, 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 a guy I met last week, and he, he was telling me, like, he, he just was radically converted and, and just kept on living with the girl that he was living with and, and getting high. And then, you know, as he read the Bible, deeply loving Jesus, living with a woman that's not his wife, constantly getting high, as the scriptures, he would come across scriptures that convicted him. He'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm not supposed to do that? Well, okay. Now, did Jesus love him any more or any less as he navigated that season? No, he's justified not by works of the law, not by morality, but by faith in the finished work of his son. So in, in one sense, um, the law and the prophets point to Jesus' work of justification on the cross by showing you that you're not as good as you think you are. Look, I love you. You're an idolater and you're a liar, and you're an adulterer, and you're a murderer, and, you're a, and we didn't even get to the prophets. We're just talking the Ten Commandments. I didn't even roll it out. Like, look, I, I love you. I'd hang out with you. And this is what the law does. This is what the prophets do. They point to the fact that no matter how clean you think you are, you're not. The second way that the law and prophets point to Jesus' work of justification for us and how justification works is simply by Jesus fulfilling all that is in the law and the prophets, right? So it, there's this story after the resurrection of Jesus where Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with these two men, and he opens up the Old Testament, and he shows them in the law and the prophets all things concerning himself, like Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophetic promises. It's in the coming of Jesus that all the, the yes and amens are answered. He justifies us by his blood. So look at what happens here. It's not done by our effort. So, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. Here's 22. We just talked about this. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. There are no outliners. There is not an asterisk in human history. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And are justified, made right, made just by his grace as a gift 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus so that justification is a free gift and nothing more. To be justified then is to believe by faith that Christ has paid your bill in full. Now, I have heard a lot in talking about justification that some people will say, it's just really hard for me to believe that all I have to do is have faith that Jesus has wiped my slate clean. Really hard for me to believe that all I have to do is, is just simply say, okay, I believe. that You're saying that's all, that, it's that simple. Oh, so here, here's what I would say. Yes, and zoom out. And, and here's what I mean by zoom out. Justification, your faith in God's grace in the finished work of Jesus Christ has been made possible by the death of Jesus. He let people spit on him. He he let his own creation mock him and slap him and pull the beard out of his face. And they took a, a tree that he created and he held together and built a cross out of it and then took metal from the earth that he spoke into existence and they drove it through his hands and his feet and they beat him and mocked him and belittled him. And that's what our justification cost. It's not just my faith. It's the death of Jesus that justifies me. And if you zoom out and look at that, you'll marvel at it. And this is why he's saying, yes, throw your faith on the finished work of Jesus, but it's not just your, it came at such a cost, such a cost to get us out of the mess that we were in, such a cost to, as the writer of Colossians put it, cancel the record of debt. Now, what I want to do is show you a picture of what this looks like. This is Luke 18. It's our primary passage if you want to look at it. it. might help you to, let's read this passage like we were watching a movie. Right? Like you got a scene here and then it kind of cups over and kind of zooms out and makes it, you know, just think about it like we were watching a film. But I love that we don't have to guess what this parable is about because Jesus just tells us right out of the gate. Starting in verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So um, contempt simply means that you think you're better than. It's not like hostility towards. It's not you're doing something mean to them. It's not that you sneer at them. It's that I, I just, I'm better than that guy. I don't know how you do that, but I'm, this text, I'm just talking about the text, not you. I'm better than them. This is why he's telling the parable. Here we go. Scene one. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So Pharisee, think kind of blue check, Christian famous. This He's got a great YouTube channel. You go there for resources. This is the guy. He lives the kind of life that you want uh, to live. And then I, I've racked my brain for years trying to come up with a moral equivalent of a tax collector in first century Jerusalem. Tax collectors purchased the right from Rome, an occupying military force that was brutal in regards to um, rape, murder, and injustice. They purchased the right from Rome to raise an insane percentage of taxes to pay for the occupying force there in Jerusalem. I don't know a moral equivalent of that, but if we've got a good guy and a bad guy here, the tax collector is certainly the bad guy. Okay? Okay. Let's keep reading. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Look at me. Nothing wrong about his prayer. Thank you, God, that you have kept my feet From the slippery path. I have not used my authority as a Pharisee to fleece the flock of God. I have not extorted men. 
Uh, I have not committed adultery. I have not, I in turn fast twice a week. I pray. I, like, like, there's nothing wrong with this man's prayer. He has fulfilled the law and the prophets. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Hey, there is a moment coming for you by the grace of God, by the mercy of Jesus, that you will become aware that you're not what you thought you were. Your view of who you are will be painfully confronted by what you actually are. And in that moment, that is a moment of severe mercy, you will, you, you will be at the crossroads of your whole life in that moment. You will turn and justify yourself You will, like this Pharisee, look back on what is good, what you've accomplished, what is beautiful, how you're not like others. You will look around. You will find a man that that at least you're not that guy. You'll find a woman. You're like, I don't gossip like she gossips. You You will find everything in you. All the darkness that you don't think is there will try to drag your attention to justify yourself. To remember that you did this and you've accomplished this and at least you're not this and at least you're not this. This is the mantra of almost everybody I know when the Holy Spirit doesn't press and they don't just surrender to it. Or, like the tax collector, you will throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus with no justification other than to be in awe that he would love a person like you. And if you're a Christian in this room, this is how you got saved. I don't know what moral betterments you've grown in since your conversion. I think to trust in those things makes you pretty foolish. This is salvation. That in the moment where it becomes clear to me that I have fallen short of the glory of God, I can justify myself. I can turn around and I can say, well, I'm really a good person. If you look out at how broken the world is, I I can look around and be like, you know, I'm not, you know, at least I'm not that guy. I can look around and go, this is the good I've done. I can look back and go, you know, I give money to charity. I I look around and go, man, I didn't do that. Or, you know, my kids are this. I'm not, and you can justify yourself. And, And in that crossroad, you will choose the path of death. You will choose the path of self-righteousness, and you will do that thing where, where the reality of who you are will erode your present and destroy your future because you're not righteous. You're not, in your essence, a good person. Like, by what standard are you a good person? We've already established, even in here, quickly, didn't even take me long, that you're a lying, idolater, coveter who, who thinks they can counsel God. Gosh, what did that take me, 45 seconds to prove that? So in that moment, we fling ourselves on Jesus. And, and then, although in that moment, we are, you are justified in a moment. You got me? Like in a second. That's justification. I'm not talking sanctification. That's a whole other subject. I'm not talking about how we're transformed over time. I'm saying that's how you're saved. So that our testimonies as Christians are never like, I I used to do this and now I don't, or I used to be stuck in this and now I'm not. Now all those are kind of trophies of God's power. But the story was, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I threw myself on the mercy of Jesus and he wiped my slate clean. 
and he called me his beloved. And, and he threw my sins as far as the east is from the west. And, and I stand in front of him today perfect and spotless, blameless in his sight. Not because I am, but because he declares me to be. Because all that's due, my rebellion, was absorbed by Christ on the cross. And his resurrection is the evidence that it was paid in full. If I've got sin left that can condemn me, then Jesus would still be in the ground. This is justification. But let me, th- this is free. After you are justified before God, saved once and for all, there will come moments in your Christian journey where yet again you're confronted by the reality you're not quite what you thought you were. Anybody? It's like, really? That, there are a few things as painful as that moment. To think you were better than that or beyond that or stronger than that or, and, and yet as the scriptures say, your sin finds you out. You will be there again, not with salvation on the line, but fullness of life on the line. You will in that moment have to choose to look back and justify yourself or to throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus. And so here's the invitation this morning. If you're not a Christian, like not a believer, not n- never, you know, you've been like, here, here's my, let me say it this way. I just have to believe that some of you are just absolutely exhausted in the Christian life. And I, I'm, I'm hoping and prayed all week that the Spirit would open up, that you're not living the Christian life. The, the Christian life's one of surrender. The, the Christian life is one of, I'm going to rest in your finished work, Jesus, not I better do these things so you'll like me. I need to fill my life with this religious activity so I can be accepted. Listen, God accepted you and saved you when you were at your worst. That's the invitation, like now. Like, like right now where you are, come to me. Augustine, my ancient friend, had this great quote. He said, I've read some beautiful things in Plato and Cicero I never read. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It does not matter to the creator of the universe. Let me say this. It does not matter to your creator what's gone on in your past or what you're right now struggling with. The invitation is throw yourself on my mercy and grace. There's grace for you. There's a clean slate for you. There's spiritual riches for you. But you will not fix what's broken in you. It's deeper than that. And so I want to lay it out there, man. You, you've never done that. You, you've either had a different, weirder version of Christianity where you've got to try to tip some scales that don't exist in your favor. You just feel utterly exhausted and never really felt the life of Christ coursing through your spirit. Throw yourself on the mercy of God. It's the invitation that exists for you. Or, or maybe um, you, you're a Christian in here and you're, you're in a bit of a moment of crisis where you, oh man, I'm not what I thought I was. I'm telling you, I've been there. I'm quasi there. I mean, I'm full there right now. And then, like, what do you do with that? Do you look back and you find all your victories and you start to stack up your victories to go, yeah, but, but look at this. I fast twice a week. I, I pray. I've never done, at least I'm not that guy. Or do you just throw yourself on the mercy of God? You, you never outgrow your need for the gospel. Ever. You'll never outgrow your need for the gospel. You'll never outgrow how desperately you're in need of the forgiving, saving compassion of the God of the universe. So here's my invitation. I'm just proxy giving it. The one who knows you, the one who knows all of your failures and struggles, the one who knows those moments where you feel gross and, and like everything I'm saying applies to other people but can't apply to you, says to you, come, you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Rest in my finished work. 
Rest in my grace. Rest in my mercy. And maybe you're in a situation right now, Christian, brother, sister, where you've been awakened to things. Oh, man, I am that kind of man. I didn't think I was. I am that kind of woman, and I didn't think I was. What an opportunity, again, to throw yourself afresh onto the mercies of God. So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to stand and sing, and here's my invitation. If you want to step in to justification, you want to surrender to it, then we've got men and women that will be along that back wall, and you don't have to have a lot of answers. You can just say, hey, I, yes. I'm throwing myself on his mercy. I've been trying to justify myself. I've been trying to fix myself. I've been trying to order my life, and I keep failing, and I just can't imagine that I could be forgiven for what I've done. You, you just say that. It's like, man, I'm, I'm busted. I want this justification thing. They'll ask some questions. They'll pray for you. If you want to be baptized, we'll, we'll flip and baptize you today. Just celebrate like crazy in this joint. Or, or maybe you're, you're like I am. You're in another season where you're like, God, really? thought I was past that. I didn't think I had that in me. And, and the impulse to justify is overwhelming, so instead, you refuse to and throw yourself back on the mercy of God. He is the just judge and offers to those of us who would believe upon his mercy forgiveness fully, freely, and forever. Let's pray. Father, I bless these men and women. We marvel at your justifying work. Forgive us where we try to lean on our pedigree or lean on the law or kind of stack ourselves up against each other rather than just trusting in your finished work. I pray that you'd grant salvation today for those who don't have it. I, I pray that the weary find rest today. I'm gonna pray for those who are yet again at a crossroad, this time not of salvation, but a fullness of life. I pray that you grant them the grace and courage to fling themselves on your mercy anew. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing? You get to move and you want that justification. You want that forgiveness. Men and women in the back of the room.
Yeah, amen. I mean, can you imagine? No tongue could bid me thence depart. No accusation with enough weight to remove you from the presence of Jesus. We're going to end our service today in a celebration of actually what we're talking about, being justified by his broken body and shed blood. So if you're a guest with us this morning, we provide communion primarily for our members. But if you're a believer in Christ, in good standing with the church you're visiting us from, you should join us at the table. It's a good, right thing for us to rejoice together that we've been justified by no act of our own. We're not celebrating that we used to get high and now we don't, or we used to be promiscuous, now we don't, or we used to do this and now we don't. We're simply justifying that while, or we're simply celebrating that while we were at our worst, Christ died for us. And maybe you stayed in your seat because you thought it was too good to be true. And I'm just telling you, it's true. The Bible says that on the night that Jesus was arrested, that he took bread and he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then at the end of the meal, he took the cup, blessed it, said, as long as we gathered in his name, as long as we did what we just finished doing, that we should drink and remember. We have not saved ourselves, but we have been saved. Let's remember. It's good to be back. I love you. We've got quite a bit to celebrate over here as we end our services today. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Brandon Poor, and this is my daughter, Reese. And I am so excited to do this today. Reese, do you believe and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then it is my joy as your earthly father to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. choked up y'all sorry my name is stephanie poor uh, and this is our older daughter riley um riley do you believe and confess that jesus christ is your lord and savior absolutely <laughs> then it is my joy and my privilege to baptize you my sister in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit
Hi, my name is Madi, and this is my daughter. Hi, church. My name is Hannah. Um, and uh, I'm here to baptize her. So, Hannah, do you believe and confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. It is my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church. My name is Jeff Unterbug, and I have the unbelievable joy of baptizing my daughter today. Hi, I'm Riley Unterbug. Riley, do you believe and confess Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? I do. It is my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. church family. My name's Sam, and I have the joy of baptizing my brother in Christ, Will. Will, do you believe and confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Absolutely. Then it is my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I do. Then it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. is Shebaniah. Shebaniah, do you believe and confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord? He's Savior? my Lord and Savior. Amen. <laughs> it is my joy to baptize you today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Shebaniah's wife, Robin, is also getting baptized. <laughs> Robin, do you believe and confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes. It is my joy to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. stand and sing the doxology with us. Oh, wait, one more? Oh, okay, one more, just kidding. My name is Glenn Hirschberger. This is my granddaughter, Lily Berg. Lily, do you confess and promise to follow Jesus the rest of your life? All right, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. Okay, let's try that again. Best interruption ever. All right. Praise God from whom all blessings.
Thank you, church. Go in grace and peace. Have a wonderful week. A reminder, if you want to be prayed over, um, we will have men and women at the front that would love to do that.
Take me 